Scott Corrine session. Um, in this session, we will have uh, three papers in total. Uh, we started a little bit late, so we'll run a little bit late as well, five minutes. Okay. Um, so the first talk is on query-based entity comparison in knowledge graphs revisited, and it will be presented by Alina. Hi, hello. All right, um, so yeah, my name is Alina, um, and today I'm gonna talk about entity comparison in knowledge graphs. Um, so comparison is a fundamental information exploration and analysis tasks, and nowadays there are a lot of websites and tools that um, give you the ability to compare items automatically. However, practically all of them perform comparison over a fixed set of properties and following a handcrafted schema, so to say. So for instance, um, for when you compare movies, uh, you compare the um, director and uh, I don't know, year of release. When you compare retail items, you compare the size, price, etc. cetera. Um, now, this handcrafted approach does not fit uh, graph data very well. There are attempts um, to perform entity comparison over graph data, a couple of them. Uh, for instance, on Facebook, you can compare yourself uh, with a profile of another person, and then you get sort of a summary of what you have in common. Common friends, common uh, likes, events, and maybe you share uh, uh, the same university or current city. Uh, Still, um, this looks that, like the comparison is done over a predefined set of properties and um, it doesn't go beyond the information that's immediately available about you in your profile. If we would like to fully unlock comparison over uh, graph data, uh, we need to go beyond uh, domain-dependent uh, predefined schemas and we need to go beyond fixed uh, depth of analysis. Um, so, for instance, I would like to compare two companies, Telenor and uh, Vodafone, uh, using the information about them in the uh, Yago knowledge graph. That's a fragment of it. Um, how can I do it? So, um, we think of comparison um, in the following terms. Given two entities in an RDF graph, uh, for instance, Telenor and Vodafone, uh, we would like to um, find patterns in data about them that are common for the two entities. For instance, that both entities are telecom companies, and this we will call a similarity. Uh, we're also interested in patterns that differentiate uh, the two entities from one another. For instance, Telenor is located in Norway, while uh, Vodafone is a UK company, and this we will call differences. Um, and we would like to do such comparison automatically in a domain independent manner and um, preferably we would like to generate informative comparisons. Um, now a bit of um, definition. So because we are interested in essentially capturing uh, graph patterns, uh, we model comparisons as um, Sparkle queries and we're operating in the framework, uh, in the fragment of uh, select uh, basic graph patterns and some filter conditions. Um, for instance, the, the second query, Q prime, tells that um, we're trying to match something that um, an entity that has more than uh, 30,000 employees. Now, um, we require all, 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 all our queries to be unary because we want uh, them to have as answers uh, individual entities, and we also ask them to be connected because we're essentially interested in patterns in the neighborhoods, um, graph neighborhoods of the target entities, and we're not interested in uh, catching a pattern somewhere else in the graph. Um, in this presentation, I'm gonna use the simplified notation instead of uh, Sparkle syntax. I'm just gonna go with like a simple CQ notation. Um, for instance, Q prime becomes just two atoms, X has people Y, and Y more than th uh, 30,000. And finally, by Q of G, we denote the answer set of a query Q over an RDF graph, G. Right, so more formally, a similarity query is a query in our language that fits, um, that has both entities in its answer set over the given data. Uh, for instance, in our example, 
these are the similarity uh, queries. Um, both entities are telecom companies. They are located in Europe. They own other entities, and so on. Now, as you can see, not every um, not uh, every similarity query is as informative and as specific uh, as the others. Um, we are operating under the assumption that the more specific a similarity query, the better, the more informative it is, because essentially it captures more information that's common um, uh, for the two entities. And um, we can um, formally capture the notion of uh, specificity using the classic uh, notion of query subsumption, just to recapture, um, so Q, a query Q subsumes query Q prime, if for any RDF graph, the answer set of Q prime over it is contained in the answer set of Q. Um, and Q prime becomes more specific than Q. Now, um, we can, using query subsumption, we can organize all our comparison queries uh, into partial order. Well, a similarity query Look at uh, Q4, for instance. It could become more and more and more specific until it's so specific it doesn't fit both entities any longer and it fits only one of them and becomes a different query or none of them. And we're, uh, in this talk, we're interested in this gray triangle, so to say, of uh, similarity queries and specifically in its bottom corner. So the query that is the most specific um, among all of the similarity queries. Um, so we here introduced the notion of the most specific similarity query, or MSSQ, and that's a similarity query minimal with respect to subsumption. For our example, for instance, the MSSQ um, captures the pattern that both companies are telecom companies, they own other entities, they located in Europe, they were created in that um, time frame, and they have um, the number of employees between 33,000 and 91,000. Now, um, although there could be uh, many similarity queries, and actually infinitely many similarity queries, good news is that there always exists a unique MSSQ, up to query equivalence, of course, if there is any similarity query at all. So if the two entities share anything in common, then we can compute a unique MSSQ. Um, the bad news is that this will require um, time quadratic in the size of the input graph. So such computation is not possible over large uh, knowledge graphs like DPP or Yago. Uh, instead, what we can do is we try to um, approximate this computation. So we need an algorithm that would take two entities in a graph um, and compute a query which will be a similarity uh, and which be, uh, will be as closely resembling the full MSSQ as possible while the computation uh, is still scalable over large data sets. The idea of one such algorithm that I'm gonna present now is that we take um, two entities and we greedily in a breadth search manner traverse uh, their neighborhoods um, in parallel and try to collect as many uh, common patterns as possible, and in order for this to be scalable, we uh, restrict ourselves to tree-shaped patterns. Right. Um, so an algorithm constructs something called a similarity tree. Um, that's the one uh, on the right. So given the small data describing A and B here, um, the Algorithm uh, creates a similarity tree, which is a directed label tree. Every node and every edge is labeled with a pair of sets of entities. For instance, the root is always labeled with um, two sets, one containing the first uh, target entity we're interested in, and the other one containing the second entity. Um, look at the edge um, on the uh, bot, uh, the top right. So the edge is labeled, again, with two sets, one containing uh, the entity S and the other one containing entity P. So in this particular example, um, all the sets here are singletons, but that's not always the case, as we will see later. And for the sake of simplified notation, if both labels 
uh, in the pair are singletons containing the same entity, we just put that entity like t, r, or 5. Now, um, the property of uh, such a similarity tree is that it can uh, be directly translated into a query. So we take every edge uh, and it becomes a triple pattern and we translate every label either into a variable or a constant. Um, and the query corresponding to a similarity tree is guaranteed to be the similarity query. Now, um, such tree is constructed uh, in two paths. paths. Um, first, we, in the forward path, we start with uh, the input data. We generate our root label, uh, node labeled with A and B. And then for every such node internally, we're looking at all the outgoing and incoming edges that are common for the entities in the first label and in the second label. For instance, um, A and B um, both have outgoing edges um, with property R and uh, ending in um, entities 1, 2 for A and 3 for B. Okay, uh, we've covered all uh, edges for A and B. Now we move to the next um, uh, node. So, um, a, uh, or two and three both have outgoing edges labeled um, T that uh, uh, are incoming edges for, uh, edges for the entity five. So we create a new um, edge in the tree. Uh, we can also group edges three P6 and one S4. And this will result um, in a new edge in the tree. Now, this process we can repeat iteratively for as long as possible, and we can decide at what point, like at what depth of analysis we stop. Um, so this looks already like a good approximation of the pattern that's common for A and B, but in order to ensure that it actually corresponds to the similarity query, we need to uh, do a backward pass, and we start with the uh, leaves of the tree and going to the root, we um, uncouple some of the nodes. For instance, we split the node one, two, and three into two nodes, one, three, and two, three. In the final tree like this, um, for every node, for every entity in every label, if we, there should be an entity in the edge, uh, in the child edge, and there should be an entity in the child node that together uh, give you a triple in the original data. Uh, for instance, um, for the um, entity one, there will be an edge in the data uh, labeled with entity S and four. Um, when this property is fulfilled, the similarity tree is guaranteed to uh, correspond to a similarity query. Um, and this is the final query for our example. Now, we evaluated the algorithm on um, three data sets on a subset of Yago of around one million triples, on the Lubum1 uh, synthetic data set, and on a subset of the Twitter follower graph, uh, which was uh, represented as an RDF graph. Um, I'm gonna skip the um, runtime evaluation here, uh, but um, we demonstrated that the algorithm is scalable um, for depths of analysis up to four, uh, for um, graphs as large as um, one million triples. Um, in order to evaluate how closely the output query resembles the full MSSQ, um, ideally we would uh, uh, generate full MSSQs and uh, approximated queries on the same inputs and compare them. Um, this is not possible because um, on a real data, the full algorithm will um, time out. So what we did instead, um, we generated a lot of um, small randomized RDF graphs of size up to 10 triples. We ensured that um, they have various uh, structures, topologies, cyclic and acyclic. And on every such small graph, we um, generated both full MSSQ and the approximated one and we evaluated pairs of these uh, queries on the real data, on all the three data sets. Um, so uh, we know that the, subset, the answer set of the full MSSQ uh, would be the subset of the answer set of the other query, but we were interested in what's, what's the delta. Um, 
And also, uh, when we evaluate um, small patterns, um, query patterns on uh, the real data sets, um, we can see how often the cyclic and acyclic patterns actually appear in real data. Um, so um, this table contains percentages of how many entities in the whole graph, in every graph, were ma on average were matched by um, the full MSSQ and the approximated queries. Um, and uh, as you can see, um, a, so a starts for acyclic and C starts for cyclic patterns. And cyclic patterns are actually not very common in real data. So indeed, it made sense to, uh, to um, create an algorithm that focused on the acyclic um, queries. Um, and also, if we in as we increase the depth of the analysis and we reach depth three, uh, the difference uh, between how many entities were matched by the two algorithms is less than 9%. So the approximation ratio um, is quite decent. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, questions? Any questions? No? Yep. Hi. Um, there is quite a large body of literature on, on entity similarities. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about embeddings, but there are many other techniques. I was wondering whether you consider that as baselines or in general as to compare your method against? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I'm, we're aware of uh, the other approaches, of course, but uh, most of them, with the except of um, two or three that I know, they, um, they perform, for instance, similarity um, uh, computation in a, num in a, like they give you a numeric score rather than a declarative explanation of how the two entities are similar. And um, in this respect, there's not a lot of approaches uh, to compare with, and there are no benchmarks. Any other questions? Yeah. Sorry, Ben, complete apologies. I came in late for your presentation. But, but just looking at the actual results that you put through, um, just on the, the last slide, um, but fascinating difference between acyclic and cyclic yeah. graph. Would, would you just, just be able to just give us a conclusion as to as to why the why the difference in the results is so stunning? Um, so I was surprised myself when I started running the evaluations. Um, the most surprising um, thing for me was that I expected the Twitter data to be highly acyclic, while it turned out not to be the case. So it's and also, what was the explanation for that? What, what, what's your hunch as to why, why the results are showing so such different? Um, I'm not 100 percent sure. I was expecting the Twitter follower graph to be uh, to contain more cyclic patterns than the rest, and that, that's the case. Um, but um, yeah, <laughs> I was surprised myself. Any other questions? So I had a question. Um, I was trying to figure out while you were presenting the similarity tree uh, what the relation is to things like simulation and by simulations. Is there some, is it maybe similar to these notions? Um, I hope I'll answer your question with that. Um, so when you generate the MSSQ, uh, it is actually um, the homomorphic image of the two neighborhoods. Okay. Um, it's not isomorphic, so. Mm. Okay. Okay. And um, it, your MSSQ uses conjunctive queries and filters. It uses conjunctive queries and filters. What what uh, sort of uh, um, language, are you, uh, query language, are you considering? Um, yeah. So um, when you look at the similarity tree, um, so if the um, both labels of a particular node contain only numeric values inside, uh, so literals, then you can um, 
take the mean and the max uh, among both uh, sets, oh, okay, okay. and you can so generate the filter conditions. Okay. Okay. So let's thank the speaker again. Okay, uh, so the next talk is on scaling queries over knowledge graphs, and it will be presented by Elk Chan. So, hi everyone, uh, thanks for being here. I will today talk about scaling queries over knowledge graphs. I will first explain why we are actually interested in Skyline queries. We think that Skyline queries help users find interesting entities without actually uh, providing any specific weights and with respect to multiple user defined criteria. And it is based on the concept of domination. So I will actually give you an example here. This is a data set of planets with density and average speed attributes. And uh, here, basically, if we want a planet that has high density and high average speed, these are suddenly irrelevant because they are actually dominated by Earth and Venus. So the rectangles here actually present the dominance region. Another important thing is that even though Skyline queries are studied uh, quite a lot in database community. There is very little work on Skyline queries in the no, uh, over knowledge graphs in the semantic web community. And most, all of the works actually assume direct control over the data set source. So they basically assume we have control over the source and we can actually create some indexes while publishing the data. And even most importantly, we have actually standard interfaces for publishing knowledge graphs that simply do not contain Skyline queries, because actually Sparkwise specification does not have them. And here you can actually see a range of linked data interfaces on one, and we have data dumps, which is simply a downloadable link, and you do everything on the client side if you want to find something on this data set. And on the other end, we have Sparkwell endpoint, which has uh, the which supports whole Sparkle specification, and as a user, you just send a query and expect the result to be returned. And of course, the, while this has a lot of client load, actually 100% client load, this has 100% uh, server load, and there are actually TPF and BRTPF uh, in between that tries to balance this load between the client and the server. And actually, triple pattern fragments, TPF just uh, accepts triple pattern requests, and the rest is left to the client, and BRTPF actually extends it by sending the bindings together with the triple patterns. So I will now define our problem here. We have a data set, basically, with n-dimensional data objects corresponding to entities, and we have the dominates relation, which is defined by uh, we define it like that. So we say that o, o, OI actually dominates OJ if OI is better than or equal to OJ in all n dimensions, and OI is strictly better than OJ in at least one dimension. And then we define the Skyline query as a set of, uh, as a pair of BGP and uh, Skyline preferences. Skyline preferences is just the list of uh, preference functions, which is actually in this case only max and min because Generally, skylines are defined on the numeric attributes. And uh, it returns the set that contains basically all the objects that are not dominated by any other objects in the data set. 
So we basically find the interesting objects. And here, actually, you can see the uh, written version of the example query in some, like, Sparkle-like uh, syntax. So we want all the planets with average speed and density information, and we want them to be maximum, so to, to be high. And we want the skylines, basically. So the first proposed method here is basically the client-side query processing. It's just we sent the queries BGP to the server for, this might be spark valent points, TPF, PR, TPF, it doesn't matter. And then we use the block nested loop algorithm to compute the skylines over the result set. It actually makes it possible to process skyline queries without uh, extending existing interfaces. So it is actually possible to get skylines without changing the server code. This, this was the intention. And uh, here you can see the flow chart of the algorithm. So we start with an initial skyline set, which is the empty set, and then we get the solution mappings mu. So for each element in the solution mapping, we check whether uh, it is actually dominated by something in the skyline set or not. If it is dominated, this means that it cannot be in the skyline, so we just continue with the next item. And if it is not, we add it at the current mapping to the solution set, and then remove all the items that are dominated by it. And at the end, we have the skyline set, basically, which we return. I will just give, a, uh, give an example on how actually we do that on the example data set and query I, pro I uh, presented. And uh, as you remember, we want the skyline of planets with respect to average speed and uh, the distance. And these are basically the bindings for the BGP. So at each level, we just uh, consider one of them. So we start with Saturn, and since our skyline set is empty, we just add it to the skyline set. We continue with Europa Moon, since, as you see, it has actually a higher average speed and higher density than Saturn. We add it to the skyline set and uh, remove the Saturn from it. And then for Neptune, since it is already dominated by Europa Moon, we just continue. The same goes for Jupiter and Uranus. When it comes to Earth, we actually add it to the skyline set and remove Europa Moon because, uh, because it has actually higher average speed and higher density. And then when it comes to Venus, we actually notice that uh, none of them dominates each other, so we also add this to the skyline set. And then Himalaya Moon is basically uh, dominated by both of them. So at the end, our result set contains Earth and Venus. I mean, the client-side algorithm works, but the problem is that the server returns all matching triples without considering whether they can be part of Skyline or not. And of course, we have to do Skyline computation on the complete set of solution mappings. So we basically have the natural question here. How can we make server and client skyline away? And here we propose uh, SkyTPF, which is just an extension to the BRTPF with skyline-related concepts. And we include the bindings in the request just like the BRTPF. We propose an efficient client-side query processing algorithm that actually uses a pivot entity to put in the solution mappings. And the Sky TPF server is able to serve multiple HTT data sources, just like TPF and BRTPF. We have an additional dictionary-based index for numeric attributes, where we can actually get the rank of an object with respect to a predicate without uh, any problems. And then, in addition to a BRTPF request, we have a pivot solution mapping and a skyline flag. So if the skyline flag is not set, then it is just equal to the BRTPF request. On the client side, we use uh, this server to reduce the number of Skyline candidates, and it includes a specific method for determining the pivot, which I will uh, explain in the next slide. And then it computes the Skylines over candidates using the block nested loops algorithm. So here is, the, uh, here is another example, and this time we have the solution mappings for the non-Skyline part. And this is actually a classical skyline query in the database community, which is basically, I want hotels that are close to the sea and that are cheap. So I want basically two things from an hotel. And the blue ones are actually the hotels that are already uh, got by the first triple pattern. 
And then we, in order to determine the pivot, we actually send a request to SkyTPF server with a distance and price level, triple patterns, and we get the first three. This is actually a set, so it is not order, but it says that the, there are no other objects that are better than these three with respect to distance. And since D is part of both the results and also here, we actually choose it as the pivot. And then we basically send SkyTPF requests to get the uh, items that can be, uh, entities that can be part of the Skyline. And for price level, we actually have two better alternatives, E and F, with two and three as the price level. And for the distance, we don't have anything better. And then we retrieve the missing values because actually E and F doesn't have the distance value here. So we have to get it to have the complete candidate set, and then we compute the skyline on top of this. So the result is D and D, E, and F. So in order to evaluate our uh, proposed methods, we compared BRTPF plus client side algorithm with a SkyTPF based algorithm. We implemented single threaded and multi threaded versions. We use synthetic data sets as uh, in line with the state of the arts because we know the underlying distributions and we can actually get some conclusions regarding them. And we have three distributions here, correlated, independent, and anticorrelated. So the anticorrelated distribution is the most difficult one to optimize for because if an object is actually better in one attribute, it is worse in the other attribute, so you can't really do much of a pruning there. The default values for the number of entities is 10,000 and for the number of dimensions is four, and we have the query processing time, number of skyline candidates, and the number of HTTP requests as the metrics here. And for configuration, we use a, a very small virtual machine, actually, with four CPUs and eight gigabytes for the server, and two CPUs and two gigabytes for the client. So here you can see the results of our uh, algorithm's pure running power, and we can see that actually from the orange line here, uh, it is very effective for the correlated data set, because, I mean, as I said, like one object, if one object is better than the other in one attribute, it is most likely that it will be better than the other object for the other attribute. And, but the important thing is that actually we also have a very good uh, pruning power for the, uh, for the independent data set, and actually more than 50% for the independent data set, even for six dimensions, and more than 80% uh, 80 for the independent data set, even for 50K entities. Here you can see the results of uh, our algorithms with respect to the changing number of dimensions. Not surprisingly, worse performance as the number of dimensions increases, but it is important to note that actually uh, the blue and the orange are the sky TPF. So these two performs better than the BR TPF for the correlated data set and uh, it performs better up to a certain point from the independent data set. And BRTPF-based method actually performs better for the anti-correlated data set due to the fact that we can't do much of a pruning there. So it's just better to just go for the uh, BRTPF plus client-side algorithm there. And here we see the uh, query processing time with respect to number of entities and the relative performances of SkyTPF and BRTPF-based methods are quite similar here. And lastly, we have the number of HTTP requests. So, of course, as the, there are more requests as the number of dimensions increases, but we have fewer requests for SkyTPF for the correlated and independent data set, and we have fewer, data set, uh, fewer requests for the BRTPF-based method for the anti-correlated data set, and this is, again, because of the same reason. So when SkyTPF tries to find a good pivot, it actually uh, spends a lot of time, and the basically reward for that is not visible in the anti-correlated data set because we can't prune. Uh, in conclusion, we proposed methods for Skyline query processing over knowledge graphs. We proposed a client-side algorithm and a SkyTPF interface. We presented a reproducible evolution of the proposed methods 
and SkyTPF performs better than BRTPF-based method for correlated and independent data sets. And you can find more information in our uh, GitHub page. And I'm also planning to uh, put the PDF file there, so if you, have, if you want to look at it afterwards, it will be there as well. And the main message here is that like SkyTPF-based method is actually should be used unless you expect the distribution to be anti-correlated. So with that, I am finishing up. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, hi. Thank you for uh, your presentation. Uh, I was wondering if you uh, did any experiments to uh, to compare the scalability of Sky TPF versus BR TPF uh, in terms of the number of concurrent clients. Well, for this one, we have only one client, so we didn't do it. But actually, in the future, we are planning to do that and also planning to develop more indexing algorithms on Sky TPF. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, so I, I, I was just wondering, it might be a, not a relevant question, but um, in terms of actually using this technique to actually predict um, behavior or predict um, future events, I, I think your hypothesis sets up that um, you would expect uh, the dominant paradigm to actually better predict um, across a correlated data set versus an uncorrelated data set. I was wondering if you've, you want to comment on that one. Well, uh, the, the thing is that, like, uh, as you notice, we didn't use, like, real data sets because we cannot really make any assumptions about the underlying data, and we have the problem of uh, finding out a query set that is actually not biased towards one method or the other. So there's always a question, like, how do you select these queries? For this reason, we use the synthetic data sets. But I mean, the dominance thing is defined when the Skyline query actually defined. So it is mostly like we, we assume that the user knows which attributes he, he is after or she is after. But like, he can't come up with certain weights for each of them. So there is no like, good ranking function there. And this is the case where we are, where, what we are addressing here. Okay. Any questions? Um, okay, so I had a last question, which is uh, relating to maybe the bigger picture of Skyline queries, um, let's say in Sparkle and RDF. Do you see any, any differences conceptually between Skyline queries over RDF versus relational databases? Any challenges that might arise? Or? Well, the graph structure is definitely a challenge. And this is also what we uh, see when we try to find a real data set that we can actually find good Skyline queries for. Because, uh, I mean, in database community, it is quite normal to assume that the data is complete. But in RDF, it is really, really incomplete. So this is also one of the things that we want to work on, like how to handle incomplete data and like what does it mean to have an incomplete data in RDF set settings. And multiple values per property, maybe things like this? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. That's also okay. like one of the things. Because we tried DBpedia, for instance, and like even GDP had like five different values for each country. So With different units. Yeah, different units. Well, different values for, I guess, like for different years. So it was not possible to get a like, good query there. Thanks a lot. So thank the speaker again. Okay.
So the next talk is titled Using a KG Copy Network for Non-Goal-Oriented Dialogues, and it will be presented by Jens. <clears throat> okay, thanks a lot. So in the next presentation, I will show you how we use knowledge graphs in order to tackle one of the major challenges in artificial intelligence. So this is work at my SDA Smart Data Analytics Group at the University of Bonn and Fraunhofer for IAS. So the first order, as with my other talks, uh, couldn't come because of visa issues, so I'm uh, taking over uh, from him. And of course, we'll first go into the motivation. So in this talk, we are dealing with uh, dialogue systems, where the goal is to have a human-like natural conversation with an intelligent agent. So as many of you may know, uh, dialogue systems are a major challenge in artificial intelligence um, in general. So there's the famous uh, Turing test from 1950, um, where Alan Turing devised uh, some methods in order to test uh, in some way how intelligent an AI system can be. So who of you has heard of this Turing test before? So pretty much all of you. So this was in 1950, and now we are um, yeah, 70 years down the road, and uh, it's still a major challenge. And there are also various uh, practical use cases. I put some of them on the on the slide. So if you would have a system allowing natural conversations, you could have more empathic assistance, therapy chatbots. You could have uh, call centers, which um, where you can replace uh, some some of the work with AI systems. You can use it for training, education, or complex navigation use cases. So dialogue systems in general can be. Um, yeah, put in several groups according to application and, and implementation. So in terms of application, we mostly distinguish between goal-oriented dialogue systems and non-goal-oriented dialogue systems. In goal-oriented dialogue systems, you usually try to achieve a specific task. So for instance, restaurant booking for a number of people at a particular time at a particular restaurant would be a goal-oriented um, dialogue. And non-goal-oriented is more chit-chat dialogue uh, or questions which do not uh, follow a specific end goal. So those are two major categories, and based on the implementation, you can also distinguish between uh, generative systems and retrieval-based systems as two main categories. In generative systems, you can uh, create arbitrary responses, whereas in retrieval-based systems, you have to select from a set of predefined responses. So there's a fixed set of re responses already, and the dialogue system has to select uh, the right response uh, for a particular user utterance. So in this talk, we are looking at uh, generative uh, dialogue systems. So those systems nowadays are usually sequence-to-sequence -sequence and neural network-based uh, models, which take as input a user utterance, so the user speaks to the system, and then they predict the next output words step-by-step. Uh, step. So this way, uh, they can flexibly create a response given a specific uh, vocabulary from which they generate their out from which they select their output words. So those uh, generative dialogue systems have been very popular in recent years and have also been used to showcase uh, the progress in artificial intelligence in general. For instance, you could feed those dialogue systems with Shakespeare novels and the system would then also um, respond uh, like Shakespeare does. Or you could uh, feed in Facebook uh, dialogues, and then you would get very short one-word responses with a lot of slang words. So those systems can adapt to the training data they actually see. So this is uh, positive. However, um, those systems are pretty weak at producing coherent, uh, knowledge-grounded responses. So co coherent in this sense means that the dialogue uh, in total makes sense if you look at multiple dialogue turns, uh, you shouldn't have contradictions between those. And knowledge grounded means that ideally each dialogue or most dialogue systems should have uh, some sort of background knowledge because you usually don't want to use them only for small talk, but you also want to get useful information out of a dialogue system. So, th so of course our community here is dealing with knowledge uh, since its inception. So the the question which we asked ourselves is whether the semantic web community or semantic technologies in general um, can help to solve this challenge of um, improving generative dialogue systems. So our research hypothesis here is that if we 
would be able to include a knowledge graph or background information into a generative system, then the correctness of dialogues uh, should improve while they should still stay very natural. So here's an example on the slide. So if someone asks which stadium does Arsenal play in, and the generative system uh, could then create a response like Arsenal's home ground is, and then Emirates Stadium should actually be information from the knowledge graph. So in, an, in a standard vanilla uh, generative system, you don't have a guarantee that actually, or you're less likely to get a correct response because there is no knowledge graph or background information. So it would select something from the output vocabulary, which could uh, well be incorrect. So in order to test this research hypothesis, we make uh, three contributions in the paper. So first, we generate a knowledge graph for football, as this is a topic which most people can easily talk about. Then we create a new training data set of uh, dialogues, which um, yeah, contains uh, 3,000 conversations about uh, football. And uh, this includes both like chit-chat and uh, factual uh, queries inside of uh, the training data set. And the third and main contribution is a new uh, neural network architecture called KG Copy, which allows integrating knowledge graphs into a generative system. So I'm going through those contributions one by one. So the first one is pretty simple. So we um, created a new soccer knowledge or fo football knowledge graph based on uh, Wikipedia information. So this is based on existing uh, previous uh, work. And yeah, as you can see on the slide, we, we cover teams, players, and some of their characteristics. It's a relatively small knowledge graph with uh, 4,400 uh, triples and less than 1,000 entities. So it was um, yeah, suit it's suitable for our purpose where we want to create a dialogue system for one particular domain. Then second, uh, we needed to create a, a training data set. So uh, first, why couldn't we use an existing data set? So there are a few uh, dialogue data sets um, out there, but some of them are, or most of them are goal-oriented. So you, you need to, or there are dialogues for completing particular tasks, whereas we focus on non-goal-oriented dialogues here. And for those which um, focus on non-goal-oriented um, non dialogues, they usually didn't contain um, well-articulated answers. Like, if, if you look at the, yeah, yeah, no, this works here. So if you uh, look at the question here, um, then the answer is uh, correct, but not, it's not a full sentence. And usually to train a generative system, you want to have a full uh, response. So that, that was the reason why we created an own um, data set here. A second step. And this was done using a Wizard of Oz study and uh, crowdsourcing. So in, in a Wizard of Oz study, you have two different roles uh, for the crowd workers. As a one role is to be the actual user. So people can ask questions or have uh, small talk conversations about football in the way they usually uh, would do. And um, yeah, they are told that there is an AI system which would then try to respond to them. But in fact, uh, the AI system is yet another user role, and there, uh, there's another group of users which tries to respond as good as possible to uh, the user um, utterances. So we did this, and we did a follow-up um, um, Amazon Mechanical Turk task to clean up, essentially, to only keep the coherent conversations, those which uh, actually make sense. Because as usual in crowdsourcing, you can also get relatively random uh, input here. So then at the end, we had a reasonably high quality uh, data set of around uh, 3,000 dialogues, which we split into train validation and uh, test set. And yeah, the dialogues were focused on particular teams. So we cover uh, 30 football teams here and have approximately 83 conversations per team. And you can see that's a medium-sized uh, output vocabulary. So the voc vocabulary is, is the number of uh, different words used in the conversations, so we get to 4,782 there. So that's the second contribution. And the third one is, of course, the main uh, challenge to create a, a generative system which can include a knowledge graph. So yeah, here, of course, the challenge, uh, just to repeat it uh, from the beginning, is that we 
want to have uh, well-articulated responses, but also want to be able to use the knowledge graph, which standard systems cannot do. So this is pretty challenging. So one could think that you could circumvent uh, this by first uh, creating a system which uh, retrieves information from the knowledge graph and then verbalizing this. However, this in itself is also a challenging, a ch challenging natural language generation task. And you would have to break it up in two steps, which also uh, causes other problems. So how did we actually um, approach this in the end? So, so here you can see the neural network architecture. On the left uh, side here, you can see um, the encoder part, and on the right side, the decoder part. So both are LSTM, uh, recurrent neural networks. So I think most of you know roughly how, the, how those things uh, work. So you, uh, for each word in the input sequence, you take uh, an, ex an existing word embedding, and then update an internal state of the LSTM. And the decoder then produces output words one by one. So that's, that's, this part here is uh, standard. Uh, but in our case, we are able to include this knowledge graph, where knowledge graph here is pretty simple. So it's just a set of triples, no, no sophisticated schema support at this stage. And uh, for the input utterances, we can compare the similarity with triples in the knowledge graph. And then we use a so-called uh, gating mechanism in order to decide whether we copy the next word from the output vocabulary or from the knowledge graph. So if we zoom in a bit into this gating mechanism, then you can see this here. So the knowledge graph consists of RDF uh, triples. So we have labels for, we assume we have labels for subject and relation. For those, we take uh, word embeddings, average them, com compare them to the word embeddings of the input uh, sequence from the user. And this allows us to create an object distribution. So we find out which triple is most relevant for the input sequence. So we get a probability distribution here. And on the other hand, we have the vocabulary distribution. That's, this is from the standard generative system. So this vocabulary distribution tells us which, which of the words in the vocabulary are most likely to be or should be produced next. And the gating mechanism then um, decides uh, which one to prefer. So it's, it's again a trainable matrix which uh, allows to find out in which situation um, the, uh, the knowledge graph should rather be used and which situation um, the vocabulary should be used. So as a result of this gate, you get another new um, probability distribution and can then select um, the maximum element from this. So in this case, um, in this case, we detected that subject and relation are similar to the input uh, sequence, and therefore this uh, the label of the object Lionel, Lionel, Lionel Messi was copied to the out output sequence. So that's why it's called KG copy, so it can copy from the knowledge graph to the output sequence. So when you look at the evaluation results, um, yeah, we are we compared on our um, football data set. So we used two metrics. Uh, the play metric is a statistical metric for word overlap. So it more or less um, compares how natural the conversations are, and higher is better. So we com compared against the vanilla sequence-to-sequence -sequence model without using a knowledge graph, and then against previous work, mem2seq, uh, which doesn't use a gating mechanism. So there we score higher, so the conversations are still um, natural. And we also looked at NDTF1, which is a metric uh, suggested in previous work. Essentially, it measures um, how well we are able, or how accurate um, we can answer uh, questions. So we can see here that we are much better than previous work, although in general we are still relatively bad. So this is a result of 23.58% uh, uh, F-score on the test set. So it's nothing which can readily be used in production. So we see it more as a first uh, baseline to get there. So we actually also compared on a different data set uh, for um, goal-driven dialogue systems. And surprisingly, um, there we also performed uh, pretty well, even though our system's not meant for this. On top of this, we also performed a human evaluation because there are also criticisms around the PLE um, metric, whether correctly captures the quality of a dialogue. So we asked humans to evaluate the correctness and human likeness on a scale from one to five. 
and we obtained better scores than previous work um, for correctness. However, it's still pretty far away from five, so many of the dialogues are still incorrect. In terms of uh, human-like or nat naturalness of the dialogues, we are scoring uh, pretty well with 3.8 here. So I think I'm running a little bit out of time, so I have to maybe quickly go through uh, some of the rest. So this is just a brief um, example of a conversation um, with our system. So here's the user. So she says, I like the team pretty much. So this is a conversation about Argentina. And the system would respond something like, I don't think there are a lot of winning. So we see a grammatical mistake here. This can happen in the system, and this is uh, due to having relatively limited training data in this case compared to the standard setting. And then the user could ask, who is the captain of Argentina? The system correctly responds by copying um, from this triple in the knowledge graph. Um, if the user further asks, do you know the name of their coach? The system again correctly responds and, and actually does uh, an implicit co-reference resolution here. So it detects that there is uh, related to Argentina. So there are f a few things the system can do well. However, it's um, at this stage also quite limited. So it's a first step. Um, for approaching a very significant challenge. However, it so far can only handle pretty simple questions. So if you ask something like, who's the youngest player in Nigeria? It cannot handle it because there are no, there's no support for aggregations and um, more complex queries. The memory mechanism is also relatively uh, simple, but I'm not going to go into detail there and come to the concluding slide. So in general, we made uh, three main contributions here. So we have a new knowledge graph for football, a new training data set, which is reusable for other researchers, um, containing around 3,000 conversations about football. And um, we, as main contribution, developed the KG Copy Network, which at the end, if you look at the evaluation results, confirmed our research hypothesis. So by including uh, knowledge, um, in particular a knowledge graph, into a generative system, we improved the, the accuracy of the system significantly. So it's now not, a, not only able to produce natural responses, but also a knowledge grounded uh, correct responses. That's it from my side. Thank you. Questions? Um, hi. I have a question about the uh, football knowledge graph. So football is quite an ever-changing domain, like coaches change and players move teams. So did you just take the snapshot of one particular moment in time? Or you modeled the changes, like events? And for, for this particular work, we just uh, consider one uh, snapshot. But you, but you could uh, update the underlying uh, knowledge graph, and the system would uh, still work. So it's not only meant for static knowledge, but um, we could uh, recreate um, a new knowledge graph used based on our scripts, and it would still work. So this was also one of the goals. Further questions, comments? Were the results that you used, um, did, did they come out of a, of a knowledge graph that was actually done post-filtering? It, it sounded like in slide, slide 12 that you, you, you went to the trouble of actually trying to get rid of, of information that, quote unquote, didn't make sense. So, um, and, and also a secondary question, which was, how did you figure out those triples that didn't make sense? Um, you, you mean purely related to the extraction process for the knowledge graph? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I think it, in this case it was possible to manually look at it because the knowledge graph is relatively limited. I mean, we have around, f I had it before, like 4,000 something uh, statements. And the input uh, data tables from Wikipedia are pretty regular. So I, I have done DVPedia myself, so I know there can still be lots of uh, issues and mistakes. Um, but it was still a data set size where you could manually look at things and um, verify them, at least for this particular snapshot here. Questions? Um, so quick, why, why did you use Wikipedia and not Wikidata or DBPD? Or yes, um, actually we, we draw an existing work, so it's, it's more or less um, standard DBPedia-like Wikipedia extraction. Um, but we uh, needed a few more details on particular players and teams, so we need some 
a, a little bit more detail in the extraction mechanisms, extracting further properties. Otherwise, it's pretty standard. So, yeah. So this was the main reason because we, if, uh, we wanted to cover a significant part of what people would talk about, and the existing data wasn't quite sufficient for this when it comes to soccer. And how how complex are the responses that can be reached at the moment, let's say, by the system? The examples you showed were X is the Y, or it could, can it generate more complex forms of of responses or? I mean, systems are generally able to create also more complex responses. I mean, I don't immediately know whether it was the case uh, here as well. Mm. Um, yeah, in other experiments, we have, we have seen uh, very complex responses here. The data, training data set is relatively limited, so I'm, I cannot say um, whether this was the case here. But, uh, but be compared with mem 2 seek um, the previous approach, and they have pretty generic and short responses. So compared to this, our responses are quite a bit more sophisticated and longer. That's why we scored also a lot higher, um, not only in the True. correctness, but also in the, in the PLEU score, because yeah. people just perceived the response, response of this system to be more natural. natural. Okay. So. Any last question or comment? No? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um,